So, verehrte Damen und Herren, es ist kurz nach 14 Uhr. Wir waren gerade auf, bei und mit den Malediven hier vorne vereint. Jetzt machen wir einen großen Sprung Richtung Afrika. CBT, Community Based Tourism, ist unser Thema jetzt in den nächsten 45 Minuten. Das Beispiel Botswana macht Schule, wie es Schule macht. Darüber wollen wir reden. Das macht Bärbel Schäfer für uns. Vielen Dank. Mit Vertretern aus Kenia, aus Costa Rica, aus natürlich Botswana, Vertretern der UNWTO mit engagierten Gründern und Gründerinnen. Es geht um Erfolgsfaktoren, um Best-Practice-Beispiele und die große Frage, wer kann uns denn nun sagen, wie man das hinbekommt, wie man das vermittelt und was hat bislang Schule gemacht? Bärbel Schäfer, Sie haben jetzt das Wort, sind uns allen bekannt aus Funk und Fernsehen. Wir wissen, Sie lieben Hessen, aber auch zum großen Teil Afrika. Deshalb heute hier Ihr Forum und äh, Ihnen ja. gehört die Bühne. Bitte schön. Dankeschön, liebe Frau Weber. Ja, wenn man heiratet, muss man ja Hessen irgendwie zwangsweise mögen, aber äh, ich mag natürlich auch Afrika. Herzlich willkommen auf der ITB. Schön, dass Sie alle da sind. Der Letzte, der vielleicht reinkommt, kann jetzt mal kurz die Tür schließen, dann äh, können wir nämlich auch anfangen. Und äh, das war der deutsche Teil. We will go on in English from now on. And uh, we would like to take you on a trip to the, um, to the future a little bit. And in some parts of this world, in this African world, it's already reality. And uh, it's a little bit of a mind trip. So I hope you just had some things to drink and you had some food and you're awake for the next hour because we're going to have an interesting discussion here on this panel. And um, the future might be in tourism where governments develop harmony between nature between local government and between tourism to the benefit of all. And uh, the future will be where employees are having opportunities to develop their skills, their abilities. And the future will be where there is tourism, where there is still the pride of cultural identity and the flame of entrepreneurial skills is glowing really bright and uh, training programs do exist. And we all do have this in uh, Botswana already. So it's not only a dream, it's already reality. And uh, Botswana will be the hosting company for the country for the, for the next year. So it's quite interesting what we're gonna hear. Um, and uh, the topic of the African Forum within the next 60 minutes will be community-based tourism. CBT, that's what you should remember when you leave this room. It's a factor for success and best practice examples, which we will offer you within the next minutes. And these examples will be from Botswana and from other countries. So please welcome the panel. And uh, we start with uh, Mr. Balala, Naji Balala, Cabinet Secretary of Tourism Government of Kenya. He likes applause. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mr. Balala, nice to have you here. Maybe you take a seat here. And uh, please welcome Alejandro Castro, Marketing Manager and Deputy General Manager, Costa Rican Tourism Indus Institute. Hello. Yeah, have a seat there. And uh, please welcome Thiago Di Tebe. He's here in Berlin as well, CEO Botswana Tourism Organization. Hello, Mr. Ditiv. Nice to have you here. Maybe you take a seat here. And Elisha Grandcourt is there. I'm very happy to welcome you, Program Director, Regional Program of African World Tourism Organization, UNWTO. Long title. And we're having here on the panel Bexen Lovo, Professional Guide and CEO, African Bush Camp Group, Zimbabwe and Botswana. Welcome to the African Forum. And uh, last but not least, Stephen Mwansa, Chief Executive Officer of Zambia's Ministry of Tourism and Arts and Permanent Secretary. Welcome. Welcome. So, Mr. DT, yeah, there's one seat free, I'm sorry. Yeah, take that one. Yeah. <laughs> Or you want this one? No, uh, I think no, there you're fine. I'm, I'm happier here. <laughs> <laughs> It's an open round. So you all have microphones. I hope you're going to use them for a lively uh, discussion. And I would like to start with you, with Mr. Ditebe. Botswana, next year, 
on the ITB, are you nervous already or no. still calm? <laughs> what makes you nervous? I'm if not it, nervous. Never? Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a Botswana uh, tourism strategy? What would you say? Botswana, we consider as the sparkling diamond in Africa, mm -hmm. and especially in Southern Africa. And I'll tell you why, as far as tourism is concerned. Our tourism model is such that we've got the ecotourism sector as a well-developed sector in the industry. And a few years ago, government made a decision to ensure that we diversify the tourism product offering to add other sectors, your heritage and culture, your adventure and sports activities. Mm -hmm. But our main well-developed product is your ecotourism sector, which is actually based on wildlife mm -hmm. and wilderness experience. Because the wildlife and wilderness experience exists in our natural habitats, in pristine areas, in some parts of Botswana, and predominantly in the northern parts of the country, you have the Okabongo Delta, you have the Very Chobe famous. area, and then you have the Makadi Kadi, Below in the south, you've got the Kalahari area and the Eastern Bloc. Those are areas that are well-developed nodes as far as tourism is concerned. Mm -hmm. There are communities that live around those areas. So government made a deliberate decision um, 20 years, more than 20 years ago, to come up with a policy framework that will guide how communities participate, and I mean meaningfully participate mm -hmm. in tourism around this area. And that's the topic today, community-based tourism. Exactly. So you started really early and you talked about the diamond in your country exactly. and that a diamond is really shining. It needs sometimes a little bit of work, you know, yeah. so that it's really shining within a ring or within a country and tourism area. What would you say, which role does play community-based tourism in Botswana by now? And by now, yes. As I indicated, government made a deliberate decision what did they do? What were the concrete points? What, what we did is we developed what you call the community-based natural resource man management policy, mm -hmm. which actually mandated government and tourism operators to ensure that communities that live around these natural resources are involved in the operations of tourism. And so what we saw coming out of that are joint venture partnerships with communities mm -hmm. that live around those resources are businesses, tourism businesses, that were solidly run by communities. Uh, what we saw coming out were greenfield projects that we as Botswana Tourism Organization developed with communities to try and give them the skills and the knowledge of having how to run a tourism business. So, so that's the, uh, the results of actually us coming up with a policy mm -hmm. in Botswana. To the different points will come maybe a little bit later within the discussions. I w would like to introduce you, Alejandro Castro, and you're from Costa Rica, and you said you're really proud of your country and you'll be happy on this panel. Were you a bit irritated at the beginning when we invited you for the African Forum? Be oh, honest. Not at all. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to share with everyone, with the world, uh, what we're doing, and also learn from our peers here in the panel uh, a little of, of what they're doing in, in Africa. Because Costa Rica has been like a forerunner, one of the first countries in uh, community-based tourism. Yeah. So it's really good to have you here on, the, on this panel. What were you say made it so, this concept so successful within your country? Actually, Costa Rica is an interesting case. Uh, we develop tourism completely the opposite than any other destination develops. Uh, another destination, they would set their hotels there. Uh, they would uh, look for airlift. Uh, mm -hmm. They would have wholesalers, and then you have like a destination, right? Costa Rica was the opposite. We had a beautiful rainforest, a beautiful volcano, a lush vegetation, a, a hot springs, rivers of hot springs. Mm -hmm. So people established, uh, the communities that were there started receiving people. So they had like a little cabin, and then it turned out like business, and then it, we also had like um, people researching the rainforest, so they, they hosted them. But it, it was like uh, organically growing 
uh, but towards it sounds like it's been more like a little business not like the big business you it's know when been, you yeah. build the big hotel complexes you have an airline coming to your destination yeah. so you need patience for that the thing and is, who's investing in uh, CBT okay the thing with with uh, it was like something that really happened organically so it, it was not as planned like uh, we said yeah we did this whole uh, CBT plan mm -hmm. and it developed it was it happened because we had the resources and people started visiting and researching these forests for example monteverde is one of these areas uh, and also a, a family business developed so right now we have like the second and third generation of these family business and they've been doing a great job uh, having a high standard uh, of of uh, service is studying making business the right way and additionally right now we have a lot of in investment so we ha also have all the chains mm -hmm. but the, like the the people that started CBT were, were basically the community because uh, people visited these pristine and very incredible areas these areas also were developed because Costa Rica uh, we have a very important uh, national park systems we have 25 percent of our national territory is covered by national parks and additionally, we have around 6% of our territory covered by uh, private reserves. So people really understand the importance of uh, preserving the land uh, and, and, and they know all the privileges that, that this brings. Actually, Costa Rica right now, I was speaking earlier that we have around, we, we have more um, forest coverage right now than in the 80s. We're one of the only countries in the world to revert the deforestation rate. So we have these different things that, that have merged with tourism and they have worked perfectly. So what are the important points in your opinion if some, someone is sitting here with a maybe as nice as area as yours and says we want to start it too. What are the basic points you would say you would need because the government always has to go this way with you. Yeah. local government and uh, national the government, government has helped a lot uh, uh, with, with policies like for the national parks uh, additionally we were one of the first countries to offset carbon emissions uh, we have carbon bonds in Costa Rica an institution that does carbon bonds since 1995 so public policy is very important mm -hmm. uh, but merging with the private sector I think that the public private uh, combination that Costa Rica has created is very important mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, right now we have way more uh, like information and theory about sustainability how to balance the, the triple bottom line and that's something that we're putting in practice pretty well and it works very well right Mr. Maza who's uh, investing in CBT in your country um, quite a number of uh, entities or people but firstly I must say that the ministry that I belong to is uh, called Ministry of Tourism and Arts mm -hmm. and that is the the entity with um, legislative and regulatory mandate as well as policy mandate uh, to drive tourism, arts and culture that also includes wildlife. So sitting pretty with all those uh, what I'd say subsectors around me makes it uh, possible for my office to drive the community-based uh, tourism and uh, also ensure that uh, uh, positive results come out of that. Now the question is, who is investing? Well, firstly, government itself has invested in that uh, through what's called the Economic Empowerment Commission. Mm -hmm. uh, it's putting money to ensure that uh, a lot of um, biodiversity products are included in this empowerment uh, program. That then feeds into tourism. Uh, it's also uh, come up with, uh, firstly, the, the uh, uh, policy framework has changed where we've got a new tourism policy and a new uh, tourism act, hospitality tourism act and the wildlife act. So the first thing is to ensure that in all those areas uh, there's sufficient bed capacity so we're encouraging locals mm -hmm. to invest in hospitality so that we are able to also over and above the uh, accommodation that locals who offer, we've also got a fallback in the event people decide okay from here the, and they'll be in transit during that transit period they've got to have somewhere to to stay and mm -hmm. eat um, then uh, we are looking at uh, investing heavily in cultural centers in all the ten provinces uh, one-third of Zambia is a protected area 
uh, the landmass of Zambia is 752,000 square mm -hmm. kilometers. And to be exact, 752,614.25. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's just to, to say that quite, it's a large piece of that is a protected area. 20 national parks, 36 game management areas. So in all those areas, even when we go into the parks and game management areas, we have uh, what's called community-based uh, uh, resource groups. Mm -hmm. And these work with the people that uh, have um, uh, a concession, hunting concessions in those areas to ensure that as much of the funds they remain in the community. And that drives schools, hospitals, uh, clinics, and uh, a couple of other services that may be required where government cannot just be in all those places and we work closely with the private sector in those areas as well as... Um, so the private sector is investing as well? The private sector is investing, government is investing, mm -hmm. and then we've also got investment driven by uh, renowned NGOs, you mm -hmm. know, that uh, uh, work with us to ensure that uh, we optimally utilize our biodiversity. Okay. And that includes forestry, includes wildlife, and includes uh, these uh, beautiful water sources that mm -hmm. we have. And uh, I, I would say that uh, we are fired up and we are running. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, some of the issues we've got to deal with later on are matters of, let's say, market creation for the products of those mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, um, community areas. But if a country or a region starts a CBT-based uh, program, and uh, if you're having an idea, Mr. Valala, in innovations and ideas always need uh, someone who takes it on his back and goes through all the problems that are arising, who is having, who's on fire, who's yeah. initiating uh, something and implements the idea to others. So which would you say is the following way? Does it go from the starting from the communities or from the central government? What are, what are your experiences? Maybe before he comes yeah. in. Maybe before he comes in. <laughs> one faster. of the big differentiators <laughs> um, from the Zambian presentation with Botswana mm -hmm. is that they have a combination of both non-consumptive and consumptive. Mm -hmm. We have made a deliberate decision to go non-consumptive. There's no hunting in Botswana. Mm -hmm. So communities are involved in sustainable tourism practices. Why did you decide against it? For, because we you decided said against hunting solely because we wanted to protect and conserve the wildlife, mm -hmm. first of all, and secondly to ensure that we create sustainable jobs. Mm -hmm. Because non-consumptive tourism, it's not only about shooting the animal, but it's um, about the photograph, the value of the photographic activities mm -hmm. that you undertake, the skills that you actually build in the communities around those areas, mm -hmm. both back of house and front of house. They are sustainable skills. So that you can invested be used. In, in, in a lot of trainee programs, changing the minds, Indeed. giving the skills? Indeed. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Because we feel that that is more sustainable than the hunting uh, mm -hmm. a, a, a version of, of, of tourism. Mm -hmm. Was it hard to, to change the minds? Because for a long term, hunting. Uh, Gave money to the it, it wasn't too. hard, but we had political commitment mm -hmm. and we had to actually take communities through the process of transition from hunting to non-consumptive. Mm -hmm. And even at the moment, you still have remnants where people feel that they were better off uh, mm -hmm. doing hunting That's than non-consumptive. I mean, yeah. Because it takes a bit of time to develop the photographic mm -hmm. or non-consumptive product. Mm -hmm. Because the wildlife has to acclimatize. So there's a gap that. between there's getting gap, money and but it implement. takes a lot of commitment and training. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. I think it, it was my floor. Huh? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Mr. Uh, Balala, uh, I don't uh, forget you. I keep you in my eyes here. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, I would Short say answer. that um, uh, uh, just to digress a little bit in terms of hunting versus non, uh, I mean, uh, consumptive versus non-consumptive uh, tourism. Can we for, rise up his microphone for us, a little bit? Uh, are we okay now? Yeah, better. Thank you. For us... Uh, we have a combination of both. And we see that um, hunting need not be banned, but regulated. You know, uh, I don't want to bring that argument here as to for or against, mm -hmm. but that is the way we dri we've driven it. And uh, out of that, there must be a benefit. If there's hunting to take place, there must be a benefit. It is also for us part of sustainable wildlife management. 
because mm. uh, it brings a benefit to the community. And we've got to what I say that uh, we are a large country. One third of that is a protected area. Mm -hmm. And 20 national parks, 36 game management areas. is not the sort of thing uh, uh, one would uh, deal with uh, like at a stroke of a pen. From now on, we don't do that. Mm -hmm. The few times that we've done hunting ban has been more harmful to us because it's got to be done properly. When the communities see that there's no benefit coming, and like you know, my brother says, it takes a while to, to bring this through. In a third world country, faced with so many competing uh, needs for its uh, resource envelope, you know, it's got to be done such a way that it's, uh, it's well monitored and, and uh, uh, ha having um, uh, an effect. Mm -hmm. So back to uh, in terms of skills development. When I was earlier on, I'd say that uh, we have uh, 10 provinces, and in each one of those provinces, we have these uh, uh, cultural centers. And part of that is to be able to convert the other uh, uh, part of the biodiversity, that is forestry, onto, and, and uh, uh, proce processing industries into something that will benefit the local communities. The most important thing is that the community themselves must see the benefit. And when they see the benefit, they run with you. And if it's something that you're imposing on them, it won't work. Mm -hmm. So we got both a top-down and bottom-up uh, uh, process. Yeah, it's not on a one-way road. It's a communication both yes. sides. It's the same experience uh, you're making, well, Spolala? In, in Kenya, what we have done, we have become the pioneers of ecotourism, mm -hmm. our first uh, association of ecotourism society is uh, 1996. So we banned hunting in 1970s, immediately after our independence. Mm -hmm. We knew the effect if we don't regulate it and we have no capacity, both militarily and also technically, mm -hmm. to stop hunting. We decided to stop hunting in the 70s. Today, the communities are coming back to, to, to the government to actually create conservancies bordering the national parks and reserves because the ecosystem of these reserves is not just in the parks, it goes beyond. In fact, there are more animals in the community conservancies than in the national parks and reserves. So we are enlarging the national parks. For example, Amboseli National Park is only 380 square kilometers, which is the foothill of Mount Kilimanjaro in the Kenyan side. And today we have expanded to 9,000 square kilometers with 1,800 elephants. So in Ambose National Parks, we know the name of every elephant born. We have the pictures. We can trace even the family route of that, uh, uh, that elephant. Uh -huh. So we have a research center. Sounds uh, like family uh, members, huh? Yes, and uh, uh, family members, <laughs> bear with me, gentlemen, is only women, the female uh, elephant. So, so it's working very well. But here, the conservancies, the community directly receive revenues from the tourists that they give their land for. Mm -hmm. They are no longer just employees and working uh, in, in, in the conservancy, but they are receiving their royalty. So the speaking up, the energy comes from the community, it's not... The, the defense from comes from the community, rather is from the tourists mm -hmm. or from the government. So it's not a government driven. Government actually always comes late when the community has taken ownership of the process. Would it work if it would be government driven? Would it work? Too bureaucratic, too bureaucratic. Mm -hmm. I give you an example. You go to the marine parks in Watamu, yeah? People are saving the turtle on their own will because they know the value of the marine park where tourists come and pay the, uh, the levy and they enter into the marine park. In Lamu, people are collecting rubbish and regenerating that rubbish. And I can give you an example of a flip-flop. Flip mm -hmm. fl uh, yeah, yeah, flip-flop industry yes? from the rubbish. And then they collect it and they create souvenirs. Mm -hmm. Again, selling it to the tourism industry. Okay. So the dynamism comes from the private sector, private initiative, and the community themselves, rather of government. Government comes at the last back, where they only give the moral support mm -hmm. to the communities. But if they wouldn't give uh, the legal structures, there would be a problem, of course, too. But now I just wanted to go back to the balance, because yeah. you just said there's got to be a, a balance. Because host communities, they open... Um, 
not only their homes, they open their region for tourism and they welcome the guests from all over the world for travelers. But people meet people with different social backgrounds, you know, during this time for vacation for the tourists. So what are the most important aspects from your view that the experience will be in balance? That, def that the tourist takes home something too? I think that, that today's tourist is a different type of tourist is not the old tourist that won three, three S's, sun, sand, and sex. Mm -hmm. Today is more conscious. People want to be environmental friendly. They want to know that you have clean energy in your hotel. They want to know that your water is recycled and sanitation is clean. They want to know there's human rights and no child prostitution or, or abuse of human rights. So these are the conscious tourists. So it's not even driven by the owner of the hotel or the industry is driven by the demand of the client. Mm -hmm. and, and, and when it is driven like this, you'll see today's tourists want to interact with the communities, want to live with the communities. So we give them the opportunity. I know there'll be a, a tug of war between the mainstream hotel industry and the, the, the homestays. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to come with clear start. Here is where policy from government needs to be firm, that you allow the communities to integrate or the tourists to integrate with the communities by creating the opportunities of homestays. But does the tourist already know about community-based tourism, Mr. Castro? You think he, he's alert of that? Yeah, I think, am I, in? yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, I think tourists, uh, they, I, I, I actually, I'm, uh, I'm, I think similar to you, uh, tourists are way more conscious right now. They investigate more, more. with internet. It's very easy to know if uh, what kind of uh, feedback they uh, feedback. How, how did they do with the family if they're in a homestay? Um, do you have blogs, specialized blogs uh, on, on the theme? So right now we have way more information, and that's good for responsible destinations because uh, it, it, if, if you're a positive destination, it's gonna it, it's gonna show. And if you're doing things uh, in a wrong way, also, mm -hmm. so you need to be it's uh, public right away. Yeah, it and is. that's a problem. For that's right. And I wanted to address only that, 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 that yeah, we have something similar regarding uh, taking care of animals. Mm -hmm. We don't have hunting tourism in Costa Rica, uh, but uh, we did have in in certain rural areas uh, some people hunt like for food for survi survival reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, but right now they understood that having the jaguar alive is way better for their economy than, than killing it, uh, the turtles also. So I think that that's something, just like to wrap up that part, uh, that it's important for the communities to realize that animals uh, and conservation and, uh, and, and the long run, it's more sustainable and it's better for the economy and society and env environment uh, to preserve and live, live in harmony with it and the tourists. Yeah. The co the development for the benefit for all parties, nature, tourism, and local communities. That's right. But uh, Mr. Nalovo, you are uh, the one owning bush camps in Botswana and in Zimbabwe, so you are the closest maybe to the tourist. Uh, in your impression, do they recognize uh, CBT already? Um, you're talking about from a client's point of mm -hmm. view. From um, the client, yeah. So. Uh, again, just like my colleague said, you know, people traveling uh, these days are very well informed. There's all the available resources um, online, offline, <laughs> for people to uh, <laughs> investigate. I mean, part of somebody's journey actually is, starts when they start doing the research and planning their trip. Mm -hmm. So uh, by the time people arrive, they're very well informed. And certainly you look at countries like uh, Botswana and Zimbabwe, I mean, all of our countries, uh, people are... Um, are very well versed with practices and people will choose a destination based on the government's policy on, on sustainable utilization mm -hmm. of resources, whether it's wildlife or minerals or whatever it might be. Um, so certainly what we're finding is that, is that the market really is the one that dictates um, uh, how we all manage our resources and there, you know, the market is, is really the, 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 the policeman, as it were, um, in terms of, of how responsible we are at managing these resources. And uh, we're seeing uh, quite a very, very big radical change. Uh, I just I was very interested to obviously uh, listen to my colleagues uh, from two different countries, Zambia, and of course mm -hmm. Botswana. One still has uh, consumptive, Hunting in the other um, mm -hmm. and, and, and one no longer has consumptive. And obviously in Zimbabwe, we still have both. 
Um, but it's, it's, uh, I was listening to the panel early on when somebody says, you know, one size doesn't fit all. Um, and it's not necessarily that something that works in Zambia mm -hmm. necessarily works in Botswana. So what um, are the differences in your uh, daily business between those two countries? So I'm in the non-consumptive uh, uh, sector, and, mm -hmm. um, and for me, I think uh, what's, what's very important is, is obviously this, this, this whole uh, co uh, um, uh, you know, community-based tourism, um, is that it, it's no longer about um, uh, pro-hunting or against hunting. It's actually about sustainable utilization. As you know, globally, uh, our biggest threat to conserving these areas, or at least our biggest threat to wildlife, is the fact that we are running out of space um, for, for, for wildlife to thrive. So and is wildlife management more successful with the CBT in your eyes? Um, I, I think uh, without community-based tourism, uh, you cannot manage the wildlife because actually the communities are the true custodians of this wildlife. Mm -hmm. um, so trying to manage a wildlife resource at the exclusion of the communities is, is, is doomed to fail. Mm -hmm. Actually, it doesn't work when you, you manage it from the government perspective. Mm -hmm. You have to involve the communities because they're the custodians of that resource. And then they must benefit from the resource for mm -hmm. them to be genuinely the custodian. Mm -hmm. Kenya, in April 30th, we are going to burn 120 tons of, of ivory. Mm -hmm. And most of that does not come to, from Kenya, and because we don't have hunting, but it it's comes from the neighboring region. And that is a sad issue because we are competing as a population for land, for agriculture and food, and the, 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 the institutional capacity to secure the national reserves and national parks is challenging. Mm -hmm. So the minute you allow uh, hunting, uh, it, it becomes a challenge. I understand my neighbor here, who hunting has to be sustainable through, through uh, uh, I mean, wildlife needs to be sustainable through hunting. Right, yeah. I've which got rogue we, animals to deal with at times. <laughs> we also have rogue animals every day attacking our farms yeah. and destroying the community's uh, agriculture. But we, we find a way of how even to pay compensation. Because today, if a, an elephant kills one person, then definitely is not is not a life to a life, because that is not going to work. Exactly. What we do mm -hmm. is that we compensate heavily to the community so that we can re preserve these, or conserve this animal for the future generation uh, of, our, our, of our society. Mm -hmm. So these are the challenges that we always face in Africa, but we stand up, and I'm glad Botswana is a partner into this, that we stand up and we say no, because we know the value of it. And as you're aware, the wildlife uh, population is becoming extinct, reducing yeah. every day. If we don't deliberately play a role in defending them, nobody will defend them. Without, I think just to, the, without belaying by the issue, um, we, we totally agree with the sentiment that it's not a one-size-fits-all. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not a one-size-fits-all. Mm -hmm. We totally agree with that. But what we're saying is that this is one habitat. We human beings have actually drawn imaginary lines to define our boundaries. The wildlife doesn't respect those boundaries. No. So what we should be doing, and I'll give an example of a very important tourism node um, in southern Africa, which is the Kaza area. The size of Kaza is the, uh, it's the same as the size of uh, France. There's about seven international airports in that node. There's more than six, 8,000 beds in that node, high value beds. There's more than five World Heritage sites. There's communities that live in that node. There's actually the wildlife resource that is existing in that area. But you see, the challenge is that we haven't been able to harmonize policies between the different countries that we have. On the Botswana side would be a high value tourism area. On the other side, it's in other But it would be an area. effort for all. It would be an effort for all, and still it doesn't work. It, it doesn't work. So what we're seeing is that- But there to, you get impatient. What we did that to That makes you impatient. <laughs> exactly. I come back to my first <laughs> question. Thank you very that much. That makes you <laughs> impatient. Oh, exactly. I know that because you want it to work. We want it to work, yes. Harmonize policies, make sure that we come up with land uses that are compatible to support the main product in that area, which is tourism. Yeah. yeah. So, well, maybe to add on to that. Yeah, just, just a short, <laughs> I, I come back to you shortly. All it's, right. uh, we will go back on a no hunting uh, discussion. We, can't, we can come back maybe to, to it next year or later. I just want to introduce you, uh, Alicia Grandcourt, uh, UNWTO, 
And um, I would like to ask if Africa is predestined for this segment of tourism, CBT. I think uh, whatever the, we heard different examples the discussions here. Of, of this afternoon relates very much to the mandate of uh, UNWTO, which is promoting sustainable and accessible tourism. And I think the most important point, and it's inspiring to, to note for a fact that tourism has been recognized in the national agendas of uh, our African governments. Mm -hmm. So we um, could state that as a point, it's been recognized. It's not yeah. a totally new segment anymore. It's been recognized. Yeah. Communities definitely. are aware of this. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. And uh, for us, this is uh, the approach is, is, as we've seen the discussion this afternoon, it's multidimensional through social, economic, cultural, and environmental. And also, we are guided by our global code of ethics which is where we provide a set of guiding principles to our members in order to continue to promote uh, mm -hmm. tourism in a sustainable way. Mm -hmm. And well, the, the communities are the ones, like you've seen the discussion, is they are the ones that, that fully benefit. Mm -hmm. from we are all with a lot of energy discussing about the wildlife and the, and the aspects uh, for a tourist to, to see that and to feel the energy of African wildlife. But on the other hand, we have a big benefit from Africa from the cultural side. Wow. Is that a strong point in the CBT uh, aspects as well, Mrs. Very Kongo? much so, because it's, it's not just Is cultural, it as it's the, the, the heritage as well. It's, uh, it's, uh, I think it's a mix of everything together. Yeah. I would say that it, it, it is strong, but Could what we stronger? realize with the Botswana model is that it's, it's a developmental stage. And the, 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 the revenue that you generate from, from the cultural tourism is not comparable to the non-consumptive photographic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so we, we, we are developing it, mm -hmm. but the value is not as high. As not the, yet? Exactly, you, you, not do yet. Do you see chance, chances in that uh, well, value? Well, going forward, of course, there's huge potential. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. huge potential. So, so to, that, to that extent, um, uh, the statistics in the studies done um, is that in our part of the world, actually close to 80% of reasons why people come to Africa is actually because of wildlife. So the other 20% is sightseeing, culture, etc. It's, it's a very important dynamic um, uh, component of tourism, but it certainly is not driving uh, tourism uh, uh, in Africa. I think if I, I, if I add also to that, last year we published a paper just to, to, we did a study to show the importance of the economic wildlife of, of Africa, where you derive more of, of uh, the economic value there, and which is precisely what uh, the, the point is. It's like, it's, it's ahead, but there are also the other sectors that is uh, mm -hmm. being developed. So what makes CBT successful? Is it the training program, the skills, the education, or of local it's the regions? The benefit. It's, the benefit. it's the benefit? It's the yeah. benefit that yeah. drives the CBT to be successful. Okay, that's yes. Yes. sometimes real, sometimes perceived, as it may be. <laughs> it's but, not bad but, if it's but, the benefit, uh, you know, uh, nobody minds about the benefit. No, no, the benefit. <laughs> I, I, I would say that um, uh, uh, talking here, I've just identified one challenge that we need to get uh, to relegate to the bottom. And this is a them versus us approach. We need a helicopter view of the whole problem. Mm -hmm. Get it, look at it from up there and see and have these shared values, shared uh, uh, experiences, shared visions, and come up with what is going to make people come to Africa to see Africa as a tourist destination. Mm -hmm. And when we're busy fighting over very little, small things that we have. But that's and, reality, unfortunately. You know, it's yes, still reality. and we have to migrate from that to a level whereby I don't have to reinvent the wheel when he's done it before. He said, this is what we did and this is where we are. And to get you to where we are, it will take you, these the challenges you might have are these or these and these. And then I don't have to start dealing with those. They've already been dealt with. So mm -hmm. it helps, but when we're looking at a, a community base, we are all Africans. And uh, one thing, that is the primary commonality, is that we are all Africans. And there are certain things that we see from the African angle, with the African eye. One of them is that we respect our communities. Most of us hail from those communities to come to Berlin and sit before the cameras and all that. We have a community that we come from. We would like posterity not to judge us harshly, 
by seeing those communities down. Mm -hmm. And how do we do? Then we actually come up with a, a well-framed program to ensure that those communities benefit overall from every uh, activity that is within them, especially for us tourism. Mm -hmm. And as we talk about um, uh, making the decision as to how to run with that, and I said earlier on that for me, I sit pretty in the sense that I have the wildlife on one side, I've got arts and culture all within the same house. Mm -hmm. And it helps when we're talking about moving forward, in, or we look at the, the bigger picture. But therefore, we have to uh, offer the, the different programs too, as Mr. Lovu just said. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of them probably still book a trip to see the nature, to, to enjoy uh, the wildlife. The base, uh, the base of tourism for Africa is based on wildlife and conservation. Mm -hmm. People like us in Kenya, we have a combination of all. We have the beach and we have uh, the wildlife. So we have advantage towards that. But more important thing, every day we come, we, people want to a dream life uh, to go to, or to Africa, mainly driven by the conservation programs and by wildlife. And CBTs can only succeed if there is a direct benefit from conservation mm -hmm. and from wildlife that today they can say we are the custodians, we are benefiting and we will defend and protect this sector. And this will not be a short term, it's not a sprint, no. it's like a marathon, it's a long run. It's, it's a, this a one, long time project. Th this is actually is, 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 is a character. Uh, you, you, you grow with it. For us in Kenya yeah. we started uh, doing conservation programs in 1970s. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's why we banned uh, hunting in the 1970s. We created conservancies and communities and we gave them title deeds. And today, it's bear, bearing the fruits. Tourism in Kenya is the second largest uh, foreign currency, Anna, mm -hmm. and 10% and, and of our GDP. And that is where people see the difference. Mm -hmm. So the school in your village is because of tourism. What about if, if we're talking about benefits, if something is running uh, successful, if tax money is di distributed, how do you make sure that uh, it'll move towards uh, conversation and it's not going somewhere else? For, for Kenya, we have changed the constitution and we have allowed devolved systems of governments. Mm -hmm. So 40%, almost 40%, is going to go down to the communities, to the local government. Mm -hmm. So we have two systems of government, the central government where I sit as a national minister, and then there is the local government that they receive the 40% revenue that comes to the communities. Apart from their own mm -hmm. revenue programs that they do directly without okay. yeah. the, the, the government. So that is very it's important. It's similar this, uh, this system we a, talk we about leakage. Two, we have a two-tier system where like he indicates, the community derives direct benefit from the revenue that comes into the CBO or the CBT, and they actually use that revenue to actually develop their own area. And then we have a system where there's royalties that are paid to government, and government comes up with policies that favor those tourism areas as far as disbursement of funding is concerned. Mm -hmm. We also appreciate the fact that the communities exist around these natural resources and they have to coexist with the wildlife. And therefore, in instances where there's been issues of elephant destruction and all that, we do fully compensate communities so that they see the value of okay. coexisting with the wildlife. And if they don't coexist, it's no money. Well, Less money. Well, we, we actually train them to appreciate mm -hmm. wildlife as part of the area that they live okay. in. Yeah. Yeah. Mrs. Concourt, uh, how does uh, UNWTO see the general development of CBT? I think um, for us, like we said, this is, is, uh, is at the core, and uh, we've had uh, various uh, activities that we've engaged with our member states, with Botswana, uh, the examples that has been given. Um, we've worked with other countries on different uh, um, uh, projects in Madagascar, for example, in building the lodges, but always we find that uh, there is the importance for training as well, and that's where we, we step in and give the support to our mm -hmm. members. Mr. Lovo, any alternatives to CBT in your eyes? Is there any alternative? 
Um, no, I, I, <laughs> I really think uh, there is no alternative other than to involve local communities. Mm. And there's different uh, aspects of involving uh, local communities. I mean, for example, in Zimbabwe, you've got your national parks, and some of those parks actually don't have communities right on, on their borders, but then you've got some that have those, and then you've got private conservancies, just like you have in Kenya. Um, the Zimbabwe model is, is going through a transition right now because um, yeah. uh, post uh, uh, early 2009, we became a dollarized economy. Um, and as you probably know, there was a, a very successful program um, that was introduced called Campfire, mm -hmm. uh, which the rest of Africa really took up as a model and, and it's evolved over time. You know, this thing, as we say, it, it is a journey. It's not something that happens overnight. Um, and Campfire um, was a model that the Campfire um, stood for Camp uh, uh, Community Area Management Program for Indigenous Resources. Mm -hmm. And so what we find is, is, that, is that since then, we've had, obviously, we've become a dollarized economy, um, but also there has been redistribution of land in Zimbabwe. So all of these things have overtaken Campfire. So now it needs to be remodeled. And in all of these countries, um, I mean, I commend Botswana for a very bold move of stopping hunting. Um, and, and it's something that is a journey that Botswana is, is, is also learning um, and, and, and readjusting. Uh, it has a very small population of 1.8 million versus a country like Zimbabwe that has a population of over 12 million. Mm -hmm. um, so this whole thing is something that, that, that um, you know, uh, will take time to, to, to really articulate. Mm -hmm. We all don't have to be naive. The world is not a peaceful place. And we know just yesterday we had the new um, numbers from Egypt and uh, Tunisia from the northern part of Africa due to the political situation. So to have a successful tourism, we all know we need uh, long-term peaceful structures. Is that a, a, a topic on, on CBT? One wouldn't uh, um, discount that. You know, you need peace irrespective of where you are right now. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, some of the problems we thought existed far away have followed us in our own uh, bedrooms, as it were. Um, in the areas, you know, in all those uh, communal areas, you know, where the communities are, uh, uh, are you need that. And uh, peace and stability is something you need to nurture over time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, sometimes it's triggered by the most, uh, what I'd say, uh, irregular uh, uh, situations. If we have um, uh, an accelerated and un uncontrolled human uh, wildlife conflict as a result of a growing population, running out of land, pressure to try and degazate some of the con uh, uh, areas, especially for us, game management areas, which form a buffer between the actual park mm -hmm. and uh, the open community lands. You know, that's a, a game management you area. You, you actually have to have proper plans. We've got what we call general management plans, uh, which look at uh, appropriate land use in those GMAs. Mm -hmm and appropriate land use in the sense you zone the area where the animals should be and where human pe beings should be. And we've not relented in terms of getting rid of uh, people that shouldn't be where they are, you know, what we call illegal encroachers in those uh, 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 game management areas. In the park, nobody should be there. Mm -hmm. There should be no uh, human settlements in the park, and okay. it's not negotiable. Mr. Balala, Mr. Yes. Council, uh, what, I, what I will suggest, two things. I wanted just to make a point here. One is CBT should not be controlled by the private sector or for profit. Mm -hmm. the, public, uh, the, pub, the public good will disappear. Because mm -hmm. if you allow the private sector to run it, mm -hmm. when they make losses, they will shut down that entity. That's another danger we need to be careful. Mm -hmm. The second thing, we talked about security and the figures on Egypt. It's so sad. Some countries in Africa, in Kenya, in Egypt, in Tunisia, terrorists attack the country. It's double tragedy. Mm -hmm. The country suffers. People die. And then you are being slumped by a travel advisory. Mm. Yes. That yeah. travel advisory Brain, kills the economy of that nation. Mm -hmm. So you are creating unemployment. You are creating vulnerability for youth and, 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 and the population mm. to be radicalized and go back and become terrorism. So we have to be very careful, particularly I'm talking from the Western, Western countries. We in Africa are suffering because of travel advisories. 
Kenya has suffered. We have 40% down mm -hmm. because of that. Now we are back. One year now since the last attack, we have invested 15% of the government resources to security. We should have done it in healthcare instead, but we have invested in security because we don't want any attack. Egypt has suffered. Yeah, mm -hmm. You go to Sharm el Sheikh, you are shocked. Sharm el Sheikh has become a ghost town. It's empty. You go to Tunisia. And all this is not because there is no enough security. The whole world is not secured anymore. Mm -hmm. Paris happened. Mm -hmm. Did we put a travel advisory in Paris? No. We actually all stood up and said, let's go to Paris for the climate change summit. Mm -hmm. Because we don't want to allow the terrorists to succeed in shutting down our economies. Mm -hmm. So these are the challenges we seriously need to debate. If there is a travel advisory on security, mm. I think there is a smarter way to do it rather of punishing the country by issuing a travel ban on that country. But so the reality, of course, is that the tourist is unfortunately yeah. he's sensitive and it takes a while to get back this feeling of security. It's important yeah. for us to address the issues of security. It's important for us to disseminate mm -hmm. the information about areas that have been attacked. Mm -hmm. But to put a general warning to stop people from going there, the insurance companies do not take responsibility. Mm -hmm. okay. And there is where the economy gets shut We're down. We're almost yeah. at the end. Short answer, yeah. Mr. Castro, yes. please. No, I think that uh, education is key uh, to stop violence. If you have more educated people working, uh, it's more difficult mm -hmm. to have all these situations. Uh, luckily, in Costa Rica, we have a way different situation. We don't have an army since uh, 1949, and all those funds went to education and healthcare. So that uh, we're um, a case where we see where we saw that all that money that was uh, invested in military, uh, invested in healthcare and education, does bring a well-being and, and mm -hmm. great value to society. So Botswana is getting a lot of ex attention. It Not is. only now, but next year, next more year. attention. Are you ready Maybe for all the tourists coming to your country? <laughs> with ITV, of course. Yeah. Um, we are saying that community or CBT is the way to go. Mm -hmm. um, we are transiting from your beneficiation model to make sure that communities are actively involved in tourism. And meaning, are the communities prepared for all the tourists coming to your country? Yes, because we have und actually undertaken rigorous training mm -hmm. to ensure that we train them on entrepreneurial skills so that they are actively involved. Now, back to the point from my colleague from Kenya. The, 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 as Botswana, we also suffer from, you know, painting Africa with one brush. Yes, yeah. um, there was an incident on Ebola. It For happened sure. closer to Europe, but travelers would actually cancel their holidays to come to Botswana yeah. when we are further away from, from the Ebola area and no, and no than Europe was. Nine hours so, so, so that's affecting us uh, uh, quite a lot as a destination. I Ms. Think, uh, uh, on the well. issue of security, as we know, it's, can you hear me? I, it's, it's, it's an issue that is, uh, it, that is global, and uh, like the minister said, uh, countries need to act together as well. But communication also is key in this, in this regard. As uh, Mr. Tabo clearly mentioned, when we talked about uh, Ebola, it was just about Africa, but it was not about the specific countries that were being affected in that time. So communication is key, and to have uh, uh, updated travel advisories, and for countries to learn from each other on the best practices, that they can share with each other of what they've gone through. I think it helps also. And we have to share the microphone. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Thank you for being here in this uh, Africa Forum. So I think we talked about quite some aspect. Nice to have you here. You. This is your applause, Mrs. Croncourt. <laughs> Mr. Nlovo, Mr. Ditebe from Botswana. Thank you very much, Mr. Castro. Thank you for being part of the discussion, Mr. Balala, and thank you, Mr. Mwana. Thank you. Enjoy Berlin, and uh, see you next year in Berlin. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.